music that I fall asleep to at night. It's my lullaby. Welcome to a special Election Day edition of Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd at NBC News' election headquarters here in New York City. Voters are voting. Polls are open. In all 50 states, you're looking live at a polling place in Cleveland, Ohio. Turnout in these midterms is expected to be through the roof, at least in some places. But not every place, I can tell you. Are Democrats going to show up in Florida and California? where those statewide races kind of faded a bit. As voters cast their ballots, we are also less than an hour away from our first look at the NBC News exit poll. And we're less than two hours away from the first polls closing uh, in the state of Indiana. And as candidates and official party leaders uh, and all U.S. election workers are bracing for a long night, week, month ahead. All day we've seen candidates in some of the key states casting their own ballots today at their local polling places, with some of them using it one last chance to pitch themselves to voters. And we're keeping our eye out for any voting issues. And right now we're tracking brewing disputes over ballots and reports of tabulation issues in Pennsylvania and Arizona. And we're going to be obviously monitoring those two states and those issues throughout the night. In this midterm environment, there are a lot of unusual things we're watching that could impact turnout. But there are also some usual ones, like weather. It's snowing in parts of Nevada. Are you an election day voter? That could be a problem. Are you a political party that has pushed election day voting? You see where I'm going. It's also raining in parts of Southern California, both places where there are vulnerable Democratic incumbents. So we're going to see what happens there. When it rains in L.A., it's a big deal, and it's raining in L.A. Heading into today, Democrats were bracing for a tough night. Republicans are ex uh, expressing lots of confidence that they're going to retake both chambers of Congress. They only need to flip five seats to win control of the House, and they only need one Senate seat to get control of that chamber. And as you've heard me say repeatedly, historically, a president's first midterm election is not kind to his party. But it's not just control of Congress in play tonight. Voters are also deciding the balance of power in dozens of governor's mansions and state houses, which, among other things, could determine how elections are run in some of the key presidential battlegrounds in 2024. Needless to say, it's kind of a lot riding on this election. So the question I always get on a day like this is, what do you think is going to happen? Well, of course, we can't say for sure, but here are three scenarios that I think are the most likely one of these three play out tonight and in the coming day. So we're going to look at this first one. Could be an old-fashioned wave, the type of wave where one party's turnout is not quite as good as the other party's turnout, where you have one overriding issue sort of dominant. 2010, it was health care, which was also an economic issue. It was a classic wave. Democratic uh, turnout was not great, at least compared to 08. Democrats lost 63 House seats. They lost six Senate seats. Look, they had had back-to-back -back national election victories in 06 and 08. So in some ways, they, they, they had built up a little bit of pad in the House. But that was a classic wave. Then you have the 2006 midterm. This ended up being a wave, but it was a slow motion one. In this one, the two parties were pretty competitive. Only a tiny number of voters uh, essentially decided control of the Senate. You had these six Senate seats. Three of them were decided um, by, I think, 10 or 15,000 votes. Virginia, Montana, Missouri being the most prominent ones there. So the results ended up being a wave, but the actual combination. This is the scenario, frankly, that I think tonight could be intense partisan turnout. Independents lean one way, and you get something like this. And then there's the, the night that Democrats are hoping for at this point, the polarized electorate. These were the best example of this were the 2018 midterms, where it was a wave in the House, but it wasn't a wave that allowed Democrats to win swing Senate seats in Florida, win governor's mansions in Georgia, things like that. That's why we never called it a full-fledged wave. It was a wave in the House and in the suburbs. It wasn't a wave everywhere else. Tonight, it could be a wave in rural America. Um, and independent voters may be moving in one way. But Democrats could end up holding their own, and this is a result they would take, obviously, in, an, uh, uh, in a heartbeat. So, which scenario are we headed for tonight? Polls are going to close in just a couple of hours. So, here's where we're going to look for our first clues. And it starts where I reside these days, and it's in the state of Virginia. So let me tell you what our early indicators are. Indiana 1 uh, is, is the first place we're going to get some numbers. It's just outside. This is actually in the, leads into the Chicago media market. 
Frank Mervan looks like he's going to hold off, but this, we'll see. There's a decent African-American population here. Will Jennifer Ruth Griffin, one of the good recruits that Republicans got, could she overperform? We'll get an indicator here. And then there's in Virginia, where we're going to basically have the small, medium, and large scenarios. If Republicans just win one of the three Virginia targets, um, they'll get to get control of the House, but it's not the night they're looking for. They believe they've got to win at least two of these three to have the majority that they want. They want 230 House seats. Well, they're probably winning two of these three. And if we see an old-fashioned way, Jennifer Wexton could be in trouble. So small, medium, and large is the state of Virginia when it comes to measuring the way. My NBC News colleagues are at polling places in battleground states as voters are casting their ballot. We've got Dasha Burns in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. Ali Vitale's in Tampa. Jesse Kirsch is in Youngstown, Ohio, and Blaine Alexander is in Atlanta. So let's check it all out. Dasha, let me start with you. Allegheny was a county that took forever to report. Are we going to get Allegheny tonight? Well, we're hearing that Allegheny is not going to be the problem this time around. There is much more concern around Philadelphia. And Chuck, you're not going to believe it. We are following a developing story in Luzerne County, one of our county to county locations, a place where we've been tracking voters for over a year now. We are hearing from local officials there that dozens of polling places ran out of paper today, ran out of paper to print those ballots, and voters were turned away, told to come back later. Within just the last couple of hours, the court there extended the uh, polling close times to 10 p.m. So voters now have, instead of till 8 o'clock, they have until 10 o'clock. They're hoping that some of those folks that were turned away earlier are going to come back. They have mm. to run to nearby towns to try to get more of that paper. It's, of course, not something you can just go buy at Staples. It's a, you know, kind of a, a special type of paper. <laughs> that these ballots are printed on. And there is a lot of concern about what this is going to mean. This is a critical county. It's one of the reasons we spent so much time there. Yeah. And folks are saying that this is potentially disenfranchisement for folks. And I, I, I wonder I, what we're going to start hearing out of the campaigns about this. That's just a lack of preparation. Look, I, I, I happen to know this. Uh, the, the, the issue, look, paper has been a supply chain issue. Um, the paper that's used to also print yeah. direct mail that people get in their mailboxes, you know, uh, this fact that the state didn't proactively see this, this this is something that maybe on the state or on the county here won't want to dig in more into this. But the idea that they ran out of paper, that that that's a as we like to say, that's a their that's a them problem, perhaps. Right, Dasha? <laughs> Yeah, definitely an unforced, definitely an unforced error there. I, the reaction I'm hearing from local officials is just kind of shock. How how is that something that can happen on election day? They did have some provisional ballots, but of course there are fewer of those provisionals mm. than there are the regular ballots, so they ran out of those in a lot of places as well. So it's just turning out to be a, a, a big mess. And meanwhile, over in Philadelphia, we're hearing that that process is now going to take longer because of a GOP lawsuit right. kind of backing commissioners there into a corner, making them. Uh, put in back into place a process that looks at voters who might potentially have double voted called poll book right. reconciliation that just really slows things down. So uh, we're going to be waiting a while here, Chuck. Well, I was just going to say that's the one call we can make, which is don't try to get Pennsylvania Senate results before midnight tonight. Anyway, Dasha <laughs> Burns in Pennsylvania for us. Dasha, thank you. Let's go down to Allie Vitale. She is in Tampa, Florida. And Allie, the thing that keeps in the back of my mind here, particularly in the state of Florida, the early vote looks like Democrats are not showing up. Polling indicates yeah. Democrats are fired up. The actuality in Florida doesn't seem to be matching what the polls say. What are you seeing on the ground? Yeah, it may be a question of just a lack of infrastructure here because, Chuck, even just in the last two hours, I've started getting some spin even before the polls have closed from Democrats in the state here. And what they're highlighting is the fact that they think they were doing their jobs, but that national Democrats seemingly abandoned mm. the state of Florida. And what they're pointing to is things like the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee putting 10 times the amount of money in in 2018 during the last Senate contest here as they did right now for Val Demings, who's challenging Senator Marco Rubio. The same goes on the gubernatorial front, the Democratic Governors Association investing 10 times less this cycle than they did last cycle. And so that's what Florida Democrats are starting to point to, the fact mm. that both Republican incumbents here have been consistently polling ahead. But frankly, what I've heard from both Democrats and Republicans alike here is that in Florida, the Democratic infrastructure has really faltered. And so yep. that's one explanation for why you're seeing high enthusiasm, but not 
not exactly seeing it come out in the polls because, frankly, Dosh is going to have a late night, but really, we could have a very early one here in a lot of these key races. Yeah, I know, and, and Florida is going to be probably counting their, finishing their count and preparing for a hurricane uh, yeah. perhaps before midnight. Right. Ali Vitale, uh, in what looks like a very quiet Tampa behind you there. Ali, thank you. All right. Yes. Let's go to another former battleground state. And I say former. We'll find out tonight. We're going to go to Youngstown, Ohio. That's where we find Jesse Kirsch. Look, Youngstown, this is sort of uh, the heart of the working class vote, if you will, where Democrats used to own this vote. Tim Ryan, if he, you know, this is, this is his neck of the woods. Uh, if he somehow overperforms here, he might pull the upset. What are you seeing, Jesse? Yeah, and Chuck, for context, right, we're at the heart, you said, of working class. We're at the heart of Tim Ryan's congressional district. So, right, we're looking at all these campaign signs here. This is the hometown Senate candidate. He's up against Republican J.D. Vance. And one of the things that has been a question going back to the primary here is what is former President Donald Trump's influence on this race going to be? And we saw it again last night, the former president stumping one last time on election eve with Vance in the Dayton area. But at the same time, Tim Ryan brags about agreeing with the former president on some issues. And we asked voters here, again, this is Ryan's district, so a Democratic-leaning area. We asked them what they thought. One person told us that he thinks it hurts Vance more than it helps him because he views Trump as a, quote, wild card. Uh, another voter said that he doesn't think it makes a difference for him. Both of those people said they were voting for Tim Ryan. Again, he is the hometown candidate here in Youngstown. And here's something that I think you'll get a chuckle out of. Um, we, we asked people what resonates about Tim Ryan, what they think of when they think of him. And one person told us at the same time that he knows from his parents Parents, that they see him as pro-union, so workers. That's obviously something that Ryan mm -hmm. has touted in his campaign. But at the same time, he sees Ryan as someone who flip-flops, and that is something that Vance right. has argued about Ryan. But, of course, at the same time, you could argue Vance has flip-flopped on things, including his praise now for former President Donald Trump, someone he used to take swipes at himself, uh, what feels like many moons ago. It is. It got quite personal here. The, the line I'm looking, the number I'm looking at is five. Does Ryan, is the Ryan Vance race less than five points or not? We shall see tonight. All right, let's close things out in the state that may take the longest to decide, at least in the Senate race, if it ends up in a runoff, and that is the state of Georgia. That's where we find Blaine Alexander. And Blaine, I want to start with talking about Stacey Abrams uh, and her machine, if you will. Her turnout machine overperformed in 2018. Took a race that a lot of people didn't think she was going to get close in, and she got really close. Clearly, it was the it was open the door for Democrats to do well in 2020. What's the uh, status of the Abrams machine in 2022? Well, it's making its closing arguments. You know, Chuck, I think what's interesting is the way that she's spending her final hours of this gubernatorial campaign. She's going around to small places and really kind of popping up and surprising people. You know, it's a stark difference from what we've seen from Republican Governor uh, Brian Kemp. He held a very large rally last night, had people come out, kind of your typical uh, closing argument political fair. What she did is she actually just went to the campus of Georgia State and literally just popped up, uh, started talking to students, taking some pictures, has done the same thing with a number number of stores nearby. She did something similar at a Target recently, for example, and a couple of other small stores. I asked her about her approach in the final hours, and she told me that she really is going to places where she feels the voters are underrepresented. One thing that Stacey Abrams has said all along, and she's repeated in these final hours, Chuck, is that the polls are not an accurate representation, she says, of the people who will come out, and she believes ultimately get her across the finish line. She says those are the people who are yeah. typically ignored by polls, people who don't necessarily get those phone calls. But she is making it her focus yeah. to go out and talk to those people and find those people. Something her campaign has told me is that really they're looking at the places where the early voting turnout lagged, and that's where they're being very intentional about sending her. But another thing that really is kind of a factor in all of this race, uh, Chuck, two things really, a couple of clouds that are kind of hanging over Georgia. Right. One, the new voting law, SB202, something that we've always talked about. And then, of course, the repeated doubts that have been cast on Georgia's election validity, something that election uh, workers are still still trying to overcome here, Chuck. I'm curious here. We heard already in Florida, Val Deming's campaign in particular, um, making it clear, hey, the National Party sort of abandoned us. There's no doubt the National Party has been all in on Raphael Warnock. Does Stacey Abrams believe she's gotten enough support from National Democrats from the DGA or not? 
she certainly hasn't complained about it. I do think one thing that is certainly notable is what she's talked to me and said this time around her candidacy is established. She says in 2018, she really kind of had to fight to show people that she was a legitimate candidate. She didn't have that issue this time around, and that showed in her support, that showed in the fundraising that yeah. she's been able to garner as well. Uh, and I think it's also shown in some of the big names that have come here to the state to support her candidacy. Well, there's no doubt, I think, win or lose, uh, the Stacey Abrams political machine is something that many a Democrat probably would like to have access to. Anyway, uh, Blaine Alexander in Georgia Forest. Blaine, thank you. Before that, Dasha, uh, Ali Vitale, and Jesse Kirsch. All right, you're looking at live pictures of voters hitting the polls in Las Vegas. Hours before the first polls close uh, in the state of Indiana, and results will start to come in. We're live on the ground in the battlegrounds out west of Arizona and Nevada next. And we're keeping, uh, we're going to keep going all night long. Special election night coverage starts at 6 p.m. right here on NBC News Now, featuring live results, analysis, projections all night long. Don't miss it. We'll be doing NBC's broadcast, simulcast right here on NBC News Now. So you can just keep it right here. You're watching Meet the President. Welcome back. As we've been telling you, and as we will keep telling you, it could be days before we know the results of this year's midterms. And as states work to ensure that all ballots are counted accurately, they also face growing scrutiny over the integrity of the, of the results, thanks to a large crop of Republican candidates who have embraced the former president's conspiracy theories about the 2020 election. Just a few hours ago, Carrie Lake, the Republican candidate for governor of Arizona, who has not said she would accept the results of her race, I think it depends on the outcome for her, seemed to stoke fears about election results moments ago after casting her own ballot. they got to fix this problem. This is incompetency. I hope it's not malice. But we're going to fix it. We're going to win. And when we win, there's going to be come to Jesus for elections in Arizona. There's going to be a come to Jesus. You're young. You didn't vote back in the day when I started voting, where you walked up cast your ballot, you, they counted it right there in the small precinct, and you knew the uh, results the night of the election. There have been reports of some issues with the machine counting of ballots in Maricopa County. The chairman of the county board of supervisors says they have technicians on the scene, and they assure that no voters have been disenfranchised. But what it really means is that the Arizona count is going to take longer because some of these tabulations may end up at, at a central center. So think Philadelphia. Uh, on that front, just more time for the ballots to be counted. Joining me now is our, uh, my colleague Erin McLaughlin. She's in Tucson, where Democratic Senator Mark Kelly is canvassing this hour. And Jacob Soberoth joins me from Las Vegas, where he's been speaking with voting officials there. Erin, let me start with you. Uh, what have you heard from the Kelly campaign? And, and it, what's your understanding of this tabulation issue? Hey, Chuck. Well, right now, the Kelly campaign is very much focused on getting out that vote. I am here in Tucson outside of what they call a canvas launching site for the Democrats. Minutes from now, we're expecting the arrival of Senator Mark Kelly. He's going to be addressing volunteers, volunteers who are then going to push out into neighborhoods in Tucson. They're, we're told, armed with publicly available information, lists of voters who've already voted. They're targeting those who have not. They'll be knocking on doors, uh, giving people information in terms of where uh, polling sites are uh, in the hopes of getting out that turnout, because turnout in this race, as you know, Chuck, is absolutely critical. Senator Kelly is currently neck and neck with his opponent, Republican Blake Masters. I've been pe speaking to political scientists who say that the higher the turnout, particularly with those independent voters, the better things will look for the Democrats. And mm. right now we're speaking to officials here in Pima County, and they say that turnout is on par with 2018 levels at this point in the day. Chuck. That's fascinating, Aaron, on that front. It, I'll tell you, it does depend on the state. Sometimes Republicans benefit from a higher turnout, certainly is something we've seen in the state of Florida. Uh, fascinating to hear that about Arizona. Aaron McLaughlin, thank you. Let me move over to Jacob uh, in Nevada. And Jacob, look, we are, we've gotten this is election day. There's going to be some things that you hear about, and they end up being sort of, you know, little sparks. They don't turn into fires when it comes to what's going on with tabulations. What have you heard from election officials in Nevada? 
Well, Chuck, I talked to Joe Gloria, the county clerk registrar here in uh, Clark County, the man in charge of all voting in the state. He was concerned people would be concerned about election integrity, and he wanted me and all of us to assure people that the votes are counted fair, safe, and accurately, and people should come out. And if there's any evidence that he is right and that what he has said is working, I think if the technology gods will work, we can go to the camera that's right up there, Chuck, and you can see a view of this one centralized voting location. I'm standing next to the American flag. If you can see me, I'm waving to you uh, from down here. Uh, and this is one of 128 different vote centers uh, here across Clark County, Nevada, the biggest election jurisdiction uh, in the state. Come back down here and follow me. I want to show you. Look, the line here stretches all the way around towards that department store. And then let's follow me this way. We're in a mall, obviously, Chuck. I was and these just going to say, is this what the future of malls? You yeah. are now, this is the future of malls. I We've all been so. wondering, what are we going to do with malls? Let's turn them into election We're centers. We're going to vote in malls, yeah. Chuck. Somehow it's already Christmas in the mall, but look, check this oh, out. Of so course it is. Line, it's been Christmas at Starbucks for two months. It, it's true. Oh. Uh, very true, very true. The line snakes around this room here, and then come with me over here. So Joe Gloria's big concern was, after Adam Laxalt in 2020 is talking about thousands of illegal ballots, a totally debunked, disproven uh, claim, of course, that people weren't going to show up. They are going to be nervous about the turnout uh, and actually whether their votes would be counted. Check this out, Chuck. The line stretches all the way around mm -hmm. from that atrium over there uh, through this room and all the way to the end of the street. So I think it's fair to say, so far, no glitches that we're hearing about. Right. Extraordinary levels of turnout. People have been waiting for around an hour and a half. And I think you and I both, it's a remarkable thing to see. It's an inspiring thing to see here uh, in the Las Vegas area. Uh, Jacob, uh, I'm sure I know I'm going to ask you to play weatherman here. What have you heard about Washoe and the snow up there? And has it had an impact? It hasn't been as bad as people have expected, Chuck, is what I understand from people we've talked to that have been up there. We also thought there was going to be bad weather here in Las Vegas, but just looking outside, it looks blustery, uh, but there's no rain. Uh, people are not staying away. The po folks at the polling place over here uh, were telling me that they might be concerned right. that the rain would keep people away today. Uh, but as you can see, it's looking good here. It's looking good. And that's what, by the way, both parties want it, but the Democrats with the Culinary Workers Union, you know, just trying so hard to turn people out, right. really want to see that high turnout in this area, and they're getting what they want. Well, it's fascinating. Believe it or not, Democrats in Southern California are rooting for the rain. They think it helps them, particularly in L.A. Mayor. It's fascinating where, where it depends on where you stand when it comes to uh, the weather these days. Jacob Sobora uh, in Las Vegas for us. Jacob, thank you. Joined now by our... Uh, panel today, NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray. Simone Sanders Townsend, of course, a former uh, chief spokesperson for Vice President Harris, current host of Simone on MSNBC, and Rich Lowry, editor of National Review and, and an NBC News political analyst. There's Gabby Giffords and Mark Kelly right now uh, doing uh, some get out the vote and canvassing. Um, the thing that's in the back of all of our heads tonight, Mark, is whether any of this election denialism or close elections will spark will somehow motivate bad actors to do things. And yeah. I guess that, that is the thing. It's like, what could disrupt this week? It could be that. Yeah, Chuck, you know, we've covered so many election nights, election afternoons, and you often end up hearing, hey, there are not enough paper ballots, or there's some irregularities at this particular precinct. But those things usually end up working out. There's not any kind of malice. It's just normal kind of snafus that you end up having, mm -hmm. and things get rectified. And sometimes a court needs to step in and say, hey, you know, people weren't able to vote because of this, and we're going to give an extra an hour or two to be able to be done. I also look back at what ended up happening in 2020, despite all the pro protests that we ended up hearing from former President Donald Trump, that was actually a really well-held election during a pandemic. It was like... Remarkable a, in hindsight. Remarkable. Yeah. And so when we're talking about, you know, gosh, we hope that there's not any bad actors and things mm -hmm. like I want to kind of go back and looks like even in 2020, it was a remarkable situation and on just how well election administrators, whether Republican or Democrat, actually ended up doing their jobs. Apologies, that's probably the 17,000 phone calls one of you and I have gotten that say, hey, do you have any exit polls? <laughs> if you're watching, the answer is no, not yet. That's not how it works. That's so the first thing I asked you, Jeff. Yeah, I know, exactly. No, it's, it's, it's suddenly, it's the one day that, that Mark and I are popular with everybody. Um, Simone, what I found interesting there, you know, Carrie Lake was doing get out the vote. Mm -hmm. She was, you know, I do think fear of the election 
on the Democratic side, it motivates voters, and I think Carrie Lake believes it motivates her voters. Well, you know, and, and local county officials in Maricopa County have responded. The county recorder in Maricopa County is actually a Republican, and he put out a statement mm -hmm. in response to what Carrie Lake was saying because they want people to know that every vote is going to be counted. They want people, they want to be transparent about what is happening because it is going to be close. In the last elections, uh, federal, Arizona went blue, but the state, local elections were mm -hmm. quite red. And right. so the question is, what's the situation? This go around, every single vote will count. Rich, if Republicans have a successful night, but it takes three weeks for us to know this, mm -hmm. do you think this will take some of the air out of the, the uh, that side of this argument? Or is Trump going to continue stirring this well, pot and create these problems? The ultimate source of it is, is Trump. Right. He's not going away. I mean, they announce as soon as next week. But I do think delays themselves are corrosive. And Republicans are part of the problem in, in some key states. But Pennsylvania, we're not going to know tonight. We're probably not going to know tomorrow morning. And w we all should do it, you know, the way Florida and other states do. Just count it instantly. Pre-count all the, the early vote and the absentee and give people a result. I can't believe we're going to say this. Night. Florida's the model of how to do elections. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right? Like, you know, you have to almost have a debacle mm -hmm. sometimes to get it right. And I don't, nobody wants, look, all 50 states having the same format might freak people out, too. But there's nothing wrong with following this model. There is nothing wrong with following the model, but I think per, in Pennsylvania's example, um, it is the state legislature the, who said, no, mm -hmm. you cannot count the ballots early. And so I do think that there's, you know, everybody's not on the up and up here. And it was a political reason. A lot of uh, mm -hmm. state legislators I know in Pennsylvania who are Democrats say that it's political as to why the Republican controlled state legislature would not move to count ballots early. They, they wanted the delay, a little mm -hmm. bit of the confusion. Uh, and that's just not good for democracy. All right, as we prepare for tonight, we decided, Mark, to take a look at the class of 2018 of the House members there because it's a remarkable um, how, how short-lived this <laughs> class is. Uh, and, you know, so many of them, a lot of them lost. Here what it was, it was, a pretty, uh, it was a pretty impressive class. It had a lot of moderate candidates, one in some tough districts. Um, and let me show you how many of them are left here uh, at, at this point. And you can see quite a few are not coming back. And we're going to find out tonight how many of them are going to be here. These were the frontliners that won in 18. Some of them lost in 20. Some of them decided not to run again or got remapped out in here. But it's a reminder that um, these gains can be short-lived. Yeah, and Chuck, so tonight we're going to be watching to see if someone like Abigail Spanberger is able to hold Class on. Class of 18. Uh, yeah. One of the stars. Uh, Elaine Luria, another, yeah. uh, Alyssa Slotkin. And, you know, our colleague Mike Mimoli ended up following then, before, uh, then former Vice President Joe Biden as he campaigned across the country for a lot of these folks. And it will be interesting, you know, whether or not these kind of people who a lot of them were out of the kind of the mold of Joe Biden, much younger, but people who ideologically kind of came from that kind of more establishment wing of the Democratic Party, can they actually end up holding on? And if you end up having the Spanbergers, the Slotkins, the Lurias all go down, that class of 2018 this, will be completely diminished. This has been an interesting theme among Republican operatives following the House really quickly, uh, really carefully. Th they've actually said, you know, the door's more open in Oregon and California and New York for yeah. getting really Biden districts. I mean, some Biden plus 20 districts yeah. in, in, are under threat, in theory at least, whereas some of these, these uh, districts that aren't as pro-Biden or maybe Trumpy, it's kind of harder to dislodge an incumbent who is probably there because he or she is a good politician. Sharice Davis with. is but probably the is right. pr example a, a, seat. exhibit A to me. If you're a Republican, yeah. you want that seat, though, because you can keep it for decades. You win a plus 20 Biden seat, yeah. and it's going to wash out it, it's next a, time. It's a one-term yeah. one wonder. Look, I think also um, uh, Tim O'Halloran, right, Tom O'Halloran, yes. in yeah, okay. another race to watch. If, if he can hold on, right. maybe it's looking good in some places across the You country. know, Simone, what's interesting here, and it, the same thing happens to the Republican side, the people that lose in the wave are the moderates. Mm -hmm. And then there becomes this fight. Well, the base says, well, you should have been more progressive. And these guys say, hey, it's the progressive issues that, that why I lost. What do you think the conversation is going to be tonight? I think the conversation is going to be the same. And people should have to remember, this is district by district, OK? Nebraska, too, is very different from Indiana's first congressional district. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the issues overlap, but you have to run specific to the district. In Nebraska, too, Tony Vargas, for example, uh, might be able to dislodge Don Bacon, where you have the incumbent Democratic candidate in first congressional district might get dislodged by right. a black veteran, U.S. Air Force veteran who is a Republican. Right. Who knows? You know, what's interesting about the scenarios that we've come up with is the fact that we could, 2018 was not a full wave, it was just a house wave. 
because like a trickle, right? Because they didn't, it didn't. The party didn't win the statewide races. Um, that could be what the republic. That's this mm -hmm. could be a wave in the house for Republicans, but not on the state level. Rich. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see. I mean, the the big states, obviously uh, high profile states, Georgia, where where Brian Kemp very likely is going to win tonight, probably handily. And to defy Trump on the election denial stuff, to destroy Trump's candidate in the primary, and then win this general election, and maybe bring the Senate con candidate over the top, is quite the political I, I feat. Well, can I just say, though, on that point, yeah, I ahead. am quite skeptical. There, were, there are 24 million new voters across the country right. since 2016. 2.5 million people have come out to vote in Georgia alone early voting. Mm -hmm. I have to believe that benefits Stacey Abram in some way. The, my curiosity, I agree with you and Brian Kemp. If Brian Kemp ends up with a you know, how is he not the model for how Repu and how is this not a bigger blow to Trump than maybe we're all, uh, you know, this is a reminder that this party wants to move away from Trump. Yeah, Chuck, you know, actually look at the state of Georgia. Donald Trump ended up losing several races where he had endorsed candidates. And it wasn't just in that gubernatorial race at all. And probably, I think, one of the things was the hangover from those runoffs in 2021, yeah. where Donald Trump inserted himself after losing the presidential election. The party ended up going down. And then all of a sudden, his power was not as strong. And you're exactly right. You know, you look at Brian Kemp right now, approval ratings showing him above. 50% in that state of Georgia. And probably one of the reasons why is he's doing better with independents who say, well, he's not a Trumpy kind of governor. And I think Rich yeah. is exactly right on that. Simone, if you're the Biden White House and you're dealing with a Republican Congress, you want to try to take control of that situation. What's the first bill you say, hey, let's do something together? I, I actually don't think that's where they're going to be. You have heard the White House talk about that if they if they are presented with a split Congress, mm -hmm. immigration is a place where they're going to go. That's what Trying they're to put, re, put Republicans on their heels so that Democrats can be playing offense a little bit. You want to talk about the border? Let's talk about right. the border. Here is our bill. So what you are you going to do? They'd go immigration first. I, was th I thought maybe they'd go crime first. No, I think I think it's very much more likely that they'll go immigration mm -hmm. first. It is something that the White House has been previewing, mm -hmm. uh, and there's already legislation on the table. You guys are coming back, so I'll let you think about this rich but what's the i want you to answer the question what's wow. the first i'm getting a, a 20, 20 minute 20 minutes to think what's about what's the this? first <laughs> bill that they actually want to try to get biden to sign good i'm so, glad you're not asking me that spontaneously yeah no, 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 no. Uh, I'll, I'll let you i'll let you all right so you guys are coming back up up next tonight's tipping points why results in north carolina and new hampshire could signal a night of major upsets for either party we're back at the board we're live at some polling places next but before we go to break we want to share a bit of how the NBC News Decision Desk is going to be collecting and reporting election data tonight. Our team works hard to provide real-time, accurate election results as soon as possible in a process that involves accuracy checks, independent analysis, and independent projection. And NBC only calls a race when the Decision Desk reaches a statistical 99.5% uh, competency rate in a projection. You can read more about how we call elections at NBCNews.com. Take a look. Get to know all the language. Too close to call, too early to call. We'll be right back with more. Meet the president. Welcome back. There are a lot of battleground states on the map tonight, but results from two of them specifically could signal a surprisingly good or bad night across the board for either party. These are what you might call tipping point contests. One is New Hampshire, where the Republican candidate Don Bolduck faces Democratic incumbent Maggie Hassan. Friends of the Cook Political Report have been rating this race lean Democratic. So Bolduck, who Democratic groups spent money on in the primary, hoping he'd be the easiest candidate to beat, he comes out on top. It could signal a very good night for Republicans or Democrats. It's North Carolina, which leans Republican. But if Sherry Beasley can overtake Republican Ted Budd and flip that seat for Democrats, that would be a disappointing night. Let me just show you how these things sort of mess with the math at this point. So we're already sitting here in our core six races, right? And if you start moving, we think Wisconsin is leaning Republican these days. Um, if for whatever reason, North Carolina ends up in the blue column, well, then you see what they have to do. They only need three of these remaining five, Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, Pennsylvania. They could afford to lose two. So that's how North Carolina messes the math in, in sort of in a, you know, Pat Riley had an expression in the old, in the basketball days that a series doesn't begin until the road team wins a game. This would be the equivalent of the road team pulling an upset. Well, same thing here. If New Hampshire ends up Republican, let's move North Carolina back here into our Republican column here. 
and to show you how that messes with the math. Look, they're already at 50. So then Democrats would have to win all these, and they just need to win one. I'm telling you, if they're winning New Hampshire tonight, they're probably going to win Nevada. Uh, and then all of a sudden they have control, even if Democrats win Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania. So that would be the equivalent of the Republicans, essentially, winning a road game, and then suddenly the series begins. Let's go to a couple of our correspondents in these two potential road tipping point states, if you will. Antonio Hilton is with us from Apex, North Carolina. It's one of the state's swing areas. And in Manchester, New Hampshire, that's where we find Kristen Dahlgren. Let's start North Carolina because those polls close first. Antonia, what are you seeing? The, the, the question I've had today is what kind of get out the vote operation has Sherry Beasley been able to build really without the help or as much help from the national party as other battleground states have gotten? Well, she's really been all over the place, Chuck, and that's different from most Democrats who invest most of their time in the, the urban areas of the state. And she's been in all the rural counties, in most cases, more than once. And she has a team of people who have made hundreds of thousands of voter contacts to pull off the upset that you were just describing here. And some of the early voter data shows that she's having success in rural <laughs> counties where, it, you know, a it, lot of people it, sat it, it on the it. sidelines and didn't come out for Biden in 2020. So, you know, we'll see what ends up happening tonight, but her team, the last time I saw her, she was feeling really good. The voters I'm talking to here in Apex, though, are an interesting sort of cross-section of North Carolina, because this is a place with a lot of unaffiliated voters. Most of the people I've talked to today identify that way. They're splitting their tickets. And, you know, they're more focused on issues than they are on actual candidates. They're much more worried about things like abortion and the economy than they would say they are inspired by any particular one person. So it's not really a party affiliation or a uh, really interesting sort of unusual candidate that's driving a lot of people right. here. It's sort of the divisiveness, the polarization and the frustration people are feeling. And, and Tony, in fairness, that's sort of the campaign that played out. Beasley and Bud as individuals weren't sort of front-facing, it really was sort of the attack ads against the other that was front-facing. Fair? Absolutely fair. Yeah. And they're both extremely disciplined candidates. They never, ever steer off of their sort of central message and talking points. I have tried very, very hard I in both cases <laughs> to get them to. And look, I think the upside of that means that when voters are talking about or debating these things or I'm getting into it with them at events, that it ends up being a bit more substance focused. I mean, they go in depth about how they feel about the cost of living in different parts of North Carolina right now. They talk about abortion stories or uh, their fear about what could happen to their granddaughters in the future. Uh, and so that has in some ways made the conversation more interesting from a uh, sort of substance and issue perspective. But yeah, it has meant that these races have flown under the radar because they're not the flashiest of candidates. All right. Uh, Antonia Hilton in North Carolina for us. Antonia, thanks. Let's move up north uh, to New Hampshire, where we find Kristen Dahlgren. And this is one where uh, it, it is in previous election cycles, Kristen, when there's a wave, there's always a flip in New Hampshire. So we're going to find out tonight, I think, if there's a wave, if there's a flip in New Hampshire, either in one of the two House seats or this Senate seat. What are you seeing in here? Yeah, a lot of people watching this race very closely. You know, we're at Maggie Hassan, the incumbent uh, Democrat senator uh, at her election headquarters, where they had fully expected to be having a victory party for a long time. That's not where we're standing right now. This is uh, an opponent that the party essentially selected for her, pumping money into uh, General Don Baldick's primary campaign. He was yep. an election denier, ultra MAGA. They thought he would be the easier candidate. That is not where we're standing. A lot of people here, almost everyone, I'd say 99.9% .9 of people telling me that they are very concerned about the economy. In a state that's about to have a long, cold winter, they're worried about heating fuel yep. costs. Uh, others do say that on top of that, they are also worried about reproductive rights. Uh, and those are the two issues that we're hearing the most about. And so a lot of people going to be watching to see which way New Hampshire goes. Polls have to be open until 7. Uh, can't be any open any later than 8 o'clock, and then we should hopefully start to get some results in after that. I, you would hope, Kristen, that New Hampshire could count fast, but history so sometimes <laughs> in, those, in the northern right. part of the state, let's just say uh, it takes a while. Kristen Dahlgren in New Hampshire for us. Kristen, thank you. Let's move now to Michigan, 
uh, and where we expect uh, a pretty close uh, governor's race there. The issue of abortion is quite literally on the ballot. Voters will weigh a ballot measure that, if passed, would protect the constitutional right to abortion in this state. It is something that the incumbent governor, Gretchen Whitmer, has made a big part of her campaign. You're Michelle Sindor's on the ground for us in Grosch Point, Michigan, suburb of Detroit. So, Yamish, um, what are you seeing from voters? What are you hearing? Is abortion the driver or is it the economy? Well, good afternoon, Chuck. Michigan state officials are saying that this midterm could make history when it comes to voter turnout because they're seeing a higher than expected number of people casting their ballot in these midterm elections. And that, to me, underscores just how important this election is to a lot of people's minds. And it also underscores the fact that these candidates on the Republican side and the Democratic side, their messages as they were campaigning, putting ads, that people were paying attention and listening. I want to turn a little bit just to show people that we're here in Gross Point where people are casting their ballots, they're first checking in and putting in their information, and then they're going Going over to a secure room where they're putting in their ballots and there and everything seems to be going pretty smoothly here and sometimes I also of course have to talk about the candidates in this race Democrat Gretchen Whitmer is pushing to get reelected she has made her closing argument centered on abortion saying that that is an critical part of the state of course as you said it's on the ballot there's a referendum asking voters whether or not they want to enshrine abortion rights into the state constitution now her opponent Republican Tudor Dixon is saying the exact opposite saying that abortion should not be something that people should have access to even in cases of rape and incest. She also told me that it, really the economy is the number one concern for voters and education, talking a lot on the campaign trail about parental rights and what people are being taught when it comes to race and gender. And I should tell you, when we're out on the campaign trail, we, when we were walking around today, what we've seen is people with local school board signs. That is mm. the thing that's really animating people. When you talk to them on the ground, along with abortion, I'll say, I should also note when I've been talking to voters, they have been talking about abortion, but it's really interesting just to see how the local issues are top of mind for people as well, Chuck. And it's fascinating, Michigan, the lone major battleground state where there's not a Senate race, yet this abortion referendum, I think, gave it its own little nationalized flavor, if you will. will be fascinating to watch if Michigan performs slightly differently than the battleground states that have Senate races in them. You're Michelle Sindor on the ground in Gross Point, Michigan. Thank you. Michigan, of course, is not the only state where abortion rights measures are on the ballot. Voters in four more states, California, Kentucky, keep an eye on that one in Kentucky, by the way, Montana and Vermont are all set to decide the future of abortion access and reproductive care in their states today. We'll report on those results as they come in tonight as well. After the break, Trump, Biden, McConnell, none of them are on the ballot today. But boy, are their political futures on the line tonight. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. You are looking live at pictures of voters casting their ballots in Massachusetts. First midterm polls out of parts of Indiana close in just over an hour. In just a few minutes, we're going to get our first batch of exit polls, at least get a sign of how voters are feeling in this midterm cycle. Probably the first ones you'll see has to do with what issues are top of mind for voters. But the midterms are going to have broader implications beyond who controls Congress in particular. What does it mean for Biden and Trump's political future? And how can it shake up leadership in the House and Senate? Back now is uh, my panel, former senior advisor uh, to the vice president, Kamala Harris, and host of Simone and MSNBC, Simone Sanders Townsend, and the editor of the National Review and an NBC News political analyst, Rich Lowry. Rich, I got to start with the McConnell stuff. I, there's a lot of people who have uh, lost political careers betting against mm -hmm. Mitch McConnell. So I'm not going to sit here and say, but wow, does he look vulnerable in this moment. I assume the nightmare scenario is not winning the Senate by a seat and Bullduck and Masters losing by a percentage point? Mm -hmm. Well, if, if he, he's really well liked among his colleagues. And the thing is, all the, almost all those colleagues, if they don't deeply dislike Trump, they're dismissive of him. And he, th this is the one election that McConnell could definitely win in the Republican Party right now. Is, okay, is among but let me paint a scenario colleagues. what somebody yeah. said to me, Rich, which is, are these Republicans, the first vote they make with a Republican-controlled Senate is to support Mitch McConnell? The base is going to never forget that. That that the more public this is, the the, the worse it is for McConnell. Do you agree? Well, with that? I, I just don't. I just don't see it as very realistic. What's the alternative? I mean, is Rick Scott. So Rick Rick Scott, who people talk about, his his fate is tied up with McConnell, right? So if McConnell wins a majority, Rick Scott is winning a majority. Mm -hmm. So what? 
grounds as Rick well, Scott it's had the New Hampshire McConnell. Arizona pro issue, right? Mm -hmm. That McConnell's I mean taking the blame. Yeah, right. McConnell, like who? And if Scott went in to bail bail out Baldock. I mean, that does seem to be. That's yeah. yeah, I can see that. But the sheer yeah. amount of resources that McConnell has raised and devoted to all yeah. the other races, I, th I think are get out of Now, I never thought it. I'd find myself defending Mitch McConnell, but yeah, <laughs> here I am about to do it. Um, the candidate quality issue was an issue that Rick Scott helped you know, bolster and that, not that is Mitch what McConnell, McConnell would say. Yeah. And I and, and I would have to agree with him. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, these bad candidates, the Senate right. should not be this close. Democrats should be fighting right. for their lives Let in more places than they are. What kind of uh, what, what kind of message does it send to the Democrats that a candidate they handpicked, if Don Bolduck wins that Senate seat, and the Democratic Party spent money to get that guy the nomination? It's very problematic, Chuck, and frankly, it bolsters a point that I have made. I think yep. that you we, you have to have a line there. You cannot. I just think that the that Democrats, particularly the DSCC and the DCCC, made the wrong calculation in bolstering election deniers' weak candidates. It's one thing to say this is the weaker candidate. Hopefully, this you is. You don't get moral high ground, do you? You do not. It's a whole nother thing to go in and actively spend money mm -hmm. to get that person elected and. And now, Maggie Hassan may not keep her seat. Um, let's talk about, there's going to be, it's always easiest to blame the White House and the president whenever, there's one, of the, when, and whenever there's one of these moments. He's quickly going to go overseas, which can sometimes be a good thing for a president that loses, but sometimes it leaves a vacuum. Um, what, what do you sense how the White House is going to manage this if it doesn't go well? Tonight? So I think it is notable that the president is not leaving right away. Mm -hmm. He is going to, in some way, shape or form, address the American people and the press uh, mm -hmm. on Wednesday. So we don't know what that looks like. I doubt it's a full-blown press conference. Uh, but, we know it won't uh, be. Okay, I doubt it's a full-blown press conference. I used to work there. But I do think it's going to be something. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to note, though, like, what is, I, I've been asking my former colleagues, like, well, what is bad? Because I don't think you all are bracing for a bad night, and they're not. I mean, bad would be 40-plus seats, five Senate Fif seats. 52 52 you plus know? House seats for uh, Senate seats for the because it means you're not winning the Senate 24 either. Well, that's yeah, the situation. Yeah, that's bad. I think I do not think that the White House is it believes it's gonna that it is going to be that. Here's the thing. It may be bad and we don't know that in 48 hours mm. uh, for what it's worth. Mm. And that's something mm. this is one of those where we may not know the extent for, for a few you were weeks. You talking about 18 earlier in yeah. the House, the, the House wave for Democrats. It, it, at first, it didn't seem much of a wave. I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's nothing. Oh, what were they talking about? You know, when, five you, days later, it's like, all right. Forget <laughs> five days. <laughs> it was Thanksgiving week that we called Mia Love and the 40th House seat. Mm -hmm. You're right. So that was three weeks. Rich, uh, I assume the last thing Republicans would want is Donald Trump stepping, you know, as, but he is, right, the bride mm -hmm. at every wedding, the corpse at every funeral, the candidate at every yeah. ballot. And uh, apparently the way you're supposed to say it is also the baby at every christening. Yeah. Um, so you name it. It, it just complicates the Republican majority, of course, doesn't it? Of course. I mean, Democrats want him out there more than Republicans do. And, and for his selfish interests, too, if he's running again, which he, which he is, you want a big field, right? Because maybe you have majority support in the Republican Party, and it's not a question. No one's going to take you down. It's more likely you have plurality support somewhere, mm -hmm. and you want it to break the right way. But instead, he's doing this, not uncharacteristically, yeah. this dominance move. I'm going first. I'm daring anyone else to get uh, in. Strategically, it's smart, isn't away. it? Because he is in a weak... It, look, this is to me is, is, is showing he knows he's weak, and he's got to jam the party. Mm -hmm. That's what he's trying to do, right? Yeah, but but if you, I, I'm saying rationally, if you're weak, you want a bigger <laughs> rationally, field, right? But <laughs> it, the most important person he'd want to jam, and I'm not sure he's getting jammed, is Ron DeSantis, right? Yeah. I mean, he, he could win by double digits uh, tonight. He could win Miami-Dade County. Right. Huge moment for him, and Trump wants to step all over that and say, you know what, De Sanctimonious or whatever ultimate nickname I settle on, don't get in because I'm going to destroy you. Yeah. That's the main threat to him right now. Simone, speaking of the 24 speculation. Is it important for Biden to just take that off the table quickly? Like, whatever it is, rip the Band-Aid off. If he's running, then open the office in Philadelphia in the next month. No, I don't think so. Look, okay. I think I, I think that the White House is doing what they're supposed to do, and the president will make his final decision known when it is known. I think you should take him at face value, though. The president mm -hmm. said he, you know, he intends to, to run. He believes he's running, and I think people should believe that And he that has that said if Trump runs, he's more likely to run. He well, has said he that. Well, he did beat him yeah. last time. I, mean, I was there. We were all there. There were 20-plus yeah. Democrats who jumped into a Democratic primary. Joe Biden emerged as the winner, and it was Joe Biden that beat Donald Trump. Well, the best political analysis in 2024 may have be a 
TV ad on SNL over the weekend. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, go check it out. Uh, Simone and Rich. Thank you. Uh, thank I'm going to enjoy hanging out with you guys on election night. It's going to be great. Uh, and thank you all for being with us this hour, but don't go anywhere. You can just stay here all night long because we're not stopping. We're minutes away from our first glimpse of the national exit poll data, and we're just one hour away from when the first polls start closing in the great state of Indiana. And we're just two hours away from when the first polls close for statewide races at 7 p.m. Hallie Jackson's picking up coverage right after a quick break. The special election night coverage begins at 6 p.m. And like I said, we're going all night long here on NBC News and NBC News Now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.